the Lord Baal, the geographer, has shown that Kana considered the development of Jewish sacred sites in the state of Israel, such as Mount Zion, the tomb of Rashbi in Meron, and the cave of Elijah in Haifa, as well as the invention, if you want to use Hobbesbaum, of additional sites commemorating the mythical Jewish past throughout the country to be the primary objective of his civil service. Such initiatives included the fabrication of narratives, rituals, and practices in an explicit attempt to impart Zionist and religious values to visitors and secure a mythical and historical teleology at the end of which stood the State of Israel. Similar to other government officials of his time, Kana wielded his power, often beyond his official mandate, to promote his personal and sectarian agenda in the struggle between secular and orthodox factions over which beliefs should stand at the core of Israeli public life. Kana sought to use his influence to encourage a, religion, a religious nationalistic culture which would reflect the Zionist religious agenda of subordinating the Jewish religion to the Zionist national narrative. This agenda of subordination is well articulated in an article written by Kahana in 1954 in the book called The Religious Israel, describing what he called the Israeli religious atmosphere, which his ministry hoped to, hoped to create, one where the religious attends to and reinforces the national narrative. This is what he writes. This religious atmosphere draws on, the, draws on the wellspring of our people's ancient traditions. Yet it also accounts for our re recent history, the struggle for our peoples and our country's rebirth, our latest Holocaust, our war of liberation, the foundation of the state, the task of the gathering of the exiles, and the Adhada de Geula, which is, can be translated as the inception of redemption. Now I would like to analyze this notion of Israeli religious atmosphere and more broadly Kahana's political activities. I will be using the distinction offered by Ashi Snandi between religion as ideology, that is religious as, religion as a national identifier of populations contesting for or protecting non-religious values, mostly political, and thereby accepting the baselines of Western modern discourse, and religion as belief, a tradition that is non-monolithic and plural. I argue that Kahana's transformation of Mount Zion into a focal point of religion as ideology is evident through his introduction of an array of ceremonies and rituals intended to be carried out on the mountain itself, and most particularly by regarding, by rearranging the space of the mountain. These rituals and ceremonies Kahana invented for Mount Zion were meant to express the site place within Jewish religious life in the state of Israel and globally, as well as mark it as the religious centerpiece for all the world's Jews. The Ministry of Religious Affairs took care to publish times of pilgrimage to Mount Zion during holidays in the media, thus rebranding it a pilgrimage site and leading thousands of Israeli Jews to flock there annually. On Shavuot, ministry's officials had flowers sent from Mount Zion to synagogues across the country and just intended, in a calling Kahana, to express the connection between the local synagogues and our nation's capital. Stones, you mean, stones collected from the mountain were sent to Jewish communities across the globe to be sunk into synagogue foundations. Jewish children from Western countries were invited to visit Mount Zion and celebrate their bar mitzvahs together with their Israeli peers. Damaged door scrolls from abroad were sent there for repairs before being donated to synagogues in immigrant settlements. A Judaica factory was built on Mount Zion where artifact were, artifacts were manufactured for international export. Religious feasts and rallies took place there and numerous public events across the country were symbolically linked to it by means of lighting a ceremony as torch at the site. <coughs> Numerous, pra numerous practices, some defined as religious and others not, helped cement Mount Zion as a national center. In 1958, the National Independence Day's celebrations began there, with the mountain adorned with hundreds of Israeli flags. Public ceremonies were performed during the three traditional pilgrimage festivals 
of the Jewish calendar, marking the pilgrim activities on the mountain. On Sukkot, the ministry sent palm branches, or in Hebrew, Lulavim, from Mount Zion to the heads of state, and a public prayer for global peace was held, during which 70 candles were lit, commemorating the 70 bulls sacrificed in the temple in ancient times. <coughs> the Passover pilgrimage was the most centralized and well attended of the three. During the week, organized groups of pilgrims were transported by the ministry from all over Israel to the nearby Jerusalem train station, where they were welcomed by a delegation of high-ranking officials, and Kana was, every time Kana was part of these uh, high-ranking officials. From the train station, pilgrims would march by foot to the bottom of Mount Zion, where priestly blessing, Birkat Kohanim, were performed. During Shavuot, pilgrimage were often limited to those res reservations only due to overcrowding. As I said, the establishment of Mount Zion as a religious ideological center was also ex ex expressed in a special reorganization. Apart from the Judaization of David's tomb by replacing the Muslim ornamental curtain with the, on the shrine with a Jewish one and repainting the green window bars in white and blue, a palm tree was planted in the courtyard, symbolizing the house of David. Quoting Kahana, the tree's purpose was to connect the wondrous creation of our time with the magnificent past. The magnificent past. A presidential room, which is this little chamber in the lower uh, picture, a presidential room with its own Torah scroll was added on the roof of the tomb compound and was dedicated to Israeli President Chaim Weizmann, and I'm quoting Kahana again, in memory of the renovation of ancient tradition of the two Torah scrolls that the president, I'll talk about this more in a second, that the president of Israel used to hold in his keeping. Now in Hebrew, the word president, Nasi, is both a president and a king. Mm -hmm. On the roof was also the temple observatory, which is this plate, from which visitors could view the ancient city and the temple mount. Another room at the compound was dedicated to the gathering of the exiles, Kibbutz Galuyot, in which hung a unique flag showing a deer looking backwards and a prayer for the gathering of the exiles. Beside it stood a horn, a shofar, rescued from the Nazi death camp of Bergen Berzen and intended by Kahana to be used by the Mashiach, the Messiah, when he came to declare the redemption. At the top of Mount Zion stood a large menorah the official emblem of both the state of Israel and the compound. The area of monuments at Mount Zion is highly illustrative of Kahana's identification with secular Zionism's modern political interpretation of Jewish tradition and harnessing it to service the national project. According to Amon Vaskakotsky, which I will mention some of his insights later on, this relationship reveals the repressed messianic fundamentalist core of secular Zionism itself. The ancient temple menorah transformed into the emblem of the modern state and the Mount Zion compound. And the gathering of the exile was no longer an abstract hope, but given concrete political meaning in the context of Jewish immigration to the state of Israel. The nation state became the exclusive vehicle for achieving redemption, as expressed on Mount Zion, where this glorious past is directly continuous in the newly constructed room above King David's tomb, dedicated to the Israeli president, constructing an integral link to the ancient royal dynasty. In this framework, then, the biblical past is revived in the present in the form of a secular nation state, as though it was a continuum not separated by 2,000 intervening years of exile. The notion of the nation state as the exclusive vehicle for Jewish redemption constitutes an internalization of core European modernist values and of the linear conceptualization of history they impose. Reflecting mainstream Zionism, Kana internalized this linear conceptualization of time and history and organized the Mount Zion compound to reflect it. Another important and astonishing from my, my, my point of view, another important component of the compound is the Holocaust Chamber, 
the first Israeli commemoration site of the Holocaust, before the Zionist Yad Vashem. It was established opposite to David's tomb in 1949. Ash from Nazi extermination camps was brought to the chamber and exhibited alongside various items brought from Europe after the Holocaust, such as blood-soaked Torah scrolls, a clock made of Torah scrolls that Nazi, German, that Nazi soldiers forced the Jewish tailor to sew and the like. If you want to see it, no, it doesn't work, but this, <coughs> this is the, the ash, and the Torah, the, 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 the Torah scrolls are over there. And the like. In the center of the chamber stands a wooden table intended for study and prayer to marry the souls of the victims. Some 2,000 memorial stones, which you can see on the bottom of, of, the, of the picture, so 2,000 memorial stones mark the names of Jewish communities and the precise date in which they were annihilated during the Holocaust. Delegations from those communities would pay commemorative visits to the chamber, holding memorials, lighting candles, and reciting the Kaddish prayer for the deceased. <coughs> Similar rituals took place in public and state events during the year. The location of these monuments and Lied de Memoir, or sites of memory, if we want to use Pierre Noir's term, was highly deliberate. The triangle created by David's tomb, the Holocaust chamber, and the president's room, the temple observatory, constitutes an attempt to create a timeline beginning in the biblical kingdom of Israel, continuing through the destruction of the temple, the persecution of the exile, culminating in the Holocaust, and finally, ending with the state of Israel that represents present redemption. This historical consciousness, consciousness informed not only the locations of structures within the compound, but also, and maybe even more significantly, the route set out for pilgrims, representing this historical linearity. And I'm quoting Kahana again from his book. The two main sectors in the mountain, the King David sector representing the messianic designation and the restoration of the state, and the Holocaust sector representing the destruction of the exile and the end of enslavement, are rejoined in the desire to unite the first generation of redemption with all the generations which preceded it, who have carried within them the vision of the people and their redemption, from self-sacrifice to, to heroism. In the holy days of, in the holy day of independence, towards beginning David's tomb and end of the Holocaust chamber, while on days of mourning over the destruction of the diaspora, towards beginning the chamber and end in the tomb. The redemption of Israel thus follows the destruction of the exile, just as the destruction of the temple and the land lead to the exile. It is good to point this out to those who depart the chamber into the tomb of David, which represents revival and the restoration of the state. This triangle, how, how much time do I have? Five minutes is great, I need less. The triangle of the first kingdom of Israel, the Holocaust, and the state of Israel has also found expression in the practice of placing Torah crowns on David's tomb. After the end of the 1948 war, crowns brought from post-Holocaust Europe were laid on the shrine. At first, there were 22 crowns, each representing a king from the house of David. Later on, the number of crowns corresponded to the progressive number of years since the establishment of the State of Israel. The crowns themselves too reinforced this triangle of kingdom, destruction, redemption. They were physical remains from the Holocaust and also representative of the Renaissance of the State of Israel. They were placed on David's tomb, the first the first king of the dynasty, which too was discontinued by the destruction of the temple and restored by the national Jewish state. The linearity Kana created by placing these three interlocking spaces of memory adjacent to each other reinforces Zionist narratives that negates the exile and define it as a temporary anomaly corrected by Zionist restoration of the glorious past. Moreover, as Moses Zariao and Jackie Feldman, who sits with us, argue, 
The secular Zionist near the memoir in the Memorial Mountain, and when I say Memorial Mountain, I mean the Holocaust uh, uh, commemoration site in Jerusalem, in Yad Vashem, and Mount Herzl. So the secular uh, Memoir in the Memorial Mountain also reflects this division of space into periods of time in linear progression. The, 2000, the 2003 linking path connected Yad Vashem, which represents exile and the Holocaust, to Mount Herzl, where the tombs of Herzl and Jabotinsky represent the Zionist awakening and the struggle for Jewish independence, and the National Military Cemetery represents the struggle for the State of Israel, as well as the plot of national leaders representing Jewish sovereignty. In fact, the main difference between the secular Zionist Yedi Memoir of the Memorial Mountain and the Mount Zion compound is the symbolic direction each commemorative space faces. While Mount Herzl faces westwards, the compound on Mount Zion, I, I wrote east, but it's, it's, it's north. Mm -hmm. The compound on Mount Zion faces Temple Mount. This difference alerts us to the apocalyptic understones inherent in the very same ostensibly secular historical linearity. The temple is a denied element in the Zionist mind, since its rebuilding necessarily means destroying the mosque, the mosque presently occupying the space, and therefore realizing the apocalypse. Denying the construction of the temple as the realist or logical outcome of the Zionist redempt redemptive narrative allows Zionism to create a national myth as a utopian and messianic project that ignores the apocalypse, the apocalypse inherent within it. The location of the presidential room, symbolizing redemption through the emergence of the Jewish nation state, in view of specifically the element which Zionism so profoundly rejects and denies, connects the Lied Memoir at Mount Zion to the apocalypse secular Zionism tries to avert and imposes its presence. Furthermore, the very presence of the temple as a theological object of longing and desire undercuts the very claim of Jewish nation state as the culmination of Jewish redemption and forces a confrontation with its theological core. This discrepancy calls for a reflection upon both the importance and significance and also on the limitations of religion as ideology and the linear that it creates as realized by Dr. Shmuel Zarvil Kahana on Mount Zion, but to cons and to consider the eschatological aspiration unconsciously deriving from it. And eschatologically, an eschatology that secular Zionism has, and still pretty much does, much to reject. Thank you very much. First, I, I, I thank you for that because I wanted to talk about it and I didn't have time. So. <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't manage it. Um, I think not. It's, and Kana says it all the time that Mount Zion is temporary until we go to the Western Wall, until we go to the temple. He writes in, in the 1950s about the temple and about the, the sacrifices and everything. But, and, and as a fact, right after the 1967 war, like the 1967 war ended at, and, and Jerusalem was occupied, deliberated, whatever, in, in June 4th, today. Um, two weeks after that, there's the Shavuot uh, uh, pilgrim, pilgrimage. That is the most significant, and you know, David was born and died at Shavuot by, by the tradition. And, um, and, and the newspaper, just before Shavuot, there's an article 
a, a really small okay, note that writes, the next of what the, the path to the Western Wall will be through Mount Zion, and if you want to pray there, it's fine. Um, so it won't, it wouldn't be so centralized, I'm sure. I, it, it, in fact, it's not. Today it will be there in two days. It's not centralized. Today it's, 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 it's off the beat. What? Yeah. Off the beat. Gamma. <laughs> and but and this this is important. The, the logic that Kana created, the special logic that Kana created in Mount Zion, you can see it all throughout the, the Holy Basin, or the historical Basin, all over the old city. Uh, Miriam talked about uh, Mount of Olives. I can talk about the city of David, which takes the symbol of David, connects him through, let's say, archaeology, uh, through archaeology. Faker. A, 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 a faker archaeology, okay, we can, we can talk about it. A religious Zionist project, okay, and connects David to Zionism, the King David, and the biblical uh, David, to Zionism, to the nation state in front of the temple, and, the se and another thing, just as Kana denied the mosques, the city of David denies Sirwan, denies the Palestinians in this, in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, area, by view and, and underground, both, okay? Aggressively, violently, whatever, but the same logic and the same thing happened after 1967, even though Mount Zion and will be there, it's it's, it's not of, like it was. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It's a great paper. I, I, I like the logic and I like a lot of the things that you mentioned. Um, two things that I think are, are important to consider. Uh, it, we, your paper kind of lands us in 1948. Um, and, and you kick off from there, and, and of course there's a lot of logic in that because the establishment of the state of Israel and, and you know um, the, the fact that the winding uh, border of Israel kind of encompasses Mount Zion and leaves it basically, as you said, as the only holy site. But Mount Zion is contested ground before. It. Okay, um, you mentioned and and, and you, you correctly mentioned the um, the, the 13th, 15th, and um, early 16th century, there's huge confession over Mount Zion between uh, the Muslims, uh, the Franciscans, different fractions within Christianity, that's number one, and of course in the 19th century. The 19th century is a, a, a moment in time where, for instance, um, with the arrival of the uh, uh, you know, uh, European powers on the ground here in, in this sect, this section of the Middle East, um, there's this wild uh, uh, competition between the different uh, European nation states. Um, the, the Germans managed to yank the mountain away from the protectorate of the French and build uh, the church of, uh, of, uh, of the Dormition uh, as part of their project of aligning their, their line in Jerusalem, you know, the Dormition, the Eleusa Kirche, and of course, Augusta Victoria on the Mount of Olives, and it's all part of, again, a linear project facing north. I mean, in that sense, Kahana is kind of following, if you want, on an existing logic and sort of juxtaposing the Jewish redemptive ideas upon a possible pattern that was there beforehand. Um, and again, I'm, I didn't read Kahana's writing the way you meticulously did, but I think that if you look into them, you may find traces of these ideas because he was, a, as you said, he was a very <clears throat> attentive person. And, and you see from the way he constructs things that it's, it's, he, he uses a lot of um, insight and, and innovation in the way he, he works, but he follows patterns. That's uh, one thing. Maybe the other thing. That, that, cause I, <clears throat> maybe I'll answer that question. Okay, sure. Okay. First of all, thanks. Um, the, the, the Christian tradition is really messianic. And, and mm -hmm. I, I thought about it more here, and mm -hmm. she, would, she would say that. But the, the Christian tradition is really messianic. David is not alone, he's with Jacob, the mm -hmm. brother of Jesus, and it 
it's the, the founder of right, the brother Jesus. Right, right. The, 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 the founder of Jerusalem as a city and the founder of Jerusalem as a Christian. Christian. And and Benjamin Mitudela, which I guess you call him in English. Yeah. Benjamin Mitudela. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Benjamin, 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 Benjamin of Tudela. Um, he tries to, to confront this tradition and to talk about uh, about uh, Mount Zion as the place that the Holy Ark was before it came to, to, the, to the Temple Mount. So it's a different tradition. In the 15th century, the Messianic tradition uh, was, was adopted by, by Jews. And, and Kahana is pretty much taking this tradition and giving it, I don't know if we can use a I don't know, Carl Schmitt or, or the like, giving it a nationalistic, secular, 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 modernist clothing. Mm -hmm. um, this sense, I didn't think about the German North. North, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good idea. But another thing, uh, Kana, uh, one of his letters is to the Evil Ney, mm -hmm. who writes a book about Jerusalem mm -hmm. in 1960. And he writes to him, it's a very nice book, but I don't understand why you blabber so much about the Christians and Muslims. We should talk only about the Jewish history of Jerusalem. This is what we ought to do. This, is, this serves our, our narrative, and I think this is the right thing to do. So I don't know how much he cared about, uh, or consciously cared about, mm -hmm. uh, these traditions. Okay, in a second. The second thing is I, I, thought, I thought that geographically it was interesting that um, there are two sites in pre-1967 Jerusalem that kind of frame the city within um, history slash geography. One on the extreme east is Mount Zion, and uh, almost on the extreme west is the Holy Land site where Aviona puts his reconstruction of the temple of past times, and in sort of kind of spatially framing Jerusalem in, within these two, um, between these two hilltops. Again, it's a hilltop tradition, right? Mount Herzl on the one hand, Holy Land and Mount Zion, all framing Jerusalem within a kind of a consecrated uh, yeah, religious should, secular. Should, uh, the, the nation, uh, the right, right, right. That is, that it tries to be a copy coin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tries to, to say that it's a pilgrimage site, yeah, yeah, yeah. secular Zionist pilgrimage site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's right. There is Jerusalem and sacred places. I thought someone, someone talked about it before. It's a place of contention. Of contention. What do you think? I think we have time for yeah, this. I don't know if anybody else in the room was on Mount. Zion. I don't know if anybody else in the room was on Mount Zion before '67, but I was. <laughs> and if anybody is was, they remember it. Um, I remember it as a place that people went to because it was the closest you could get to the old city. However, on the other side was a Notre, <coughs> Notre Dame to, of the Sisters of Zion, which was the other place. But that wasn't turned into a Jewish holy place because it was obviously a, a, a convent. Uh, but I don't remember the, the emphasis on it being the holy place, only it's the only one that, that was accessible. And I remember that people also went on, on Tisha B'Av, which you didn't mention. Right. So that was the so. It was basically, I mean, that's what was there, what, could go, what one could go to in Jerusalem as having a connection to the uh, biblical, uh, biblical Jerusalem. First of all, you're right. I don't know how, how much of Kana's words you can, you can like, like mm -hmm. say, you can, you can see in the field, you can, because he, he could write whatever he wants. He had, Imagination from here to Mount Zion, <laughs> and uh, uh, so so I don't know if it was. I, I heard from lots of people that uh, that were there between forty eight and sixty seven. It was a cool place. You could see the Arabs from from the old city. Um, but I heard about about these festivals and ceremonies. And about uh, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, it wasn't alone. Ninth of Av was part of a route of mourning days over both the exile and the Holocaust. Um, what what kind of tried to do, it, and he writes it too, he tries to, to make an alternative uh, memory to the exile from the one in Yad Vashem. 
he tries to make a root of memorial, memorial days uh, based on Jewish traditional memorial days, uh, the 6th of Tammuz, mm -hmm. uh, 9th of Av, Parashat uh, Zachor, just before uh, uh, Purim, the, the, the Saturday that you read the, the, the Parashat Vaikra, where by the, Midrash, the kids start to learn uh, Torah, oh. so it was a remembrance day for the children that was ki uh, killed in the Holocaust. So the ninth of Av was a part of a root of, maybe the central one, but a part of a root of, of uh, Memorial Day, the chain. The chain of Memorial Days. Um, we have time for just one very quick uh, page, uh, very short comment. I think that all you just all the things that you just described to you mm -hmm. has a very close relation to the worship of ancestral graves in the Jewish uh, Ashkenazi uh, tradition, which related to the Chassidut, mainly when the uh, Jewish people, and we still see it when they go to the Rabbi Nachman grave, and when, to the, when they go to the tzaddik yard, and it just uh, kind of translate this Jewish heritage to the new symbolic and actual grave on Mount Zion. The actual grave, I don't know. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter. Symbolic. Yeah, symbolic grave. Uh, yeah, this is what I'm trying to say, that it tries to take traditional um, practices and rituals and nationalize them. This is what this this is what I try to say, and, and, and I have to went through um, because this is was this this was his goal to, to take or this was the way he worked. He, he took uh, traditional practices. He denied other or Oriental Jews uh, practices. He denied. And he, he has a very nice letter. I will take one minute. Okay. He, he he has a letter to the Foreign Office uh, that he says you 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 you. Take uh, delegations of diplomats and and, uh, and tourists to Mount Zion, and, and, and you have make two mistakes. First of all, you take them on Saturdays, and the mountain is closed on Saturdays. <coughs> Even the cenacle, which we didn't talk about, it's closed on Saturdays because it's it's a religious site. And you're religious. religious. People don't work on Saturdays. And um, the second thing he said, he said, you don't tell me in advance. And then they come and they see all these Oriental Jews with their weird practices, with the, the noisy and, and not disgusting, and filthy, filthy uh, practices. And tell me in advance, I will take them aside and <laughs> before they come. But but it's right. It, it takes some some uh, traditional practices and uh, maybe shapes them and writes them in the in the corners. And nationalizing them. It's, it's true. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Giron Elazar, who is an anthropologist specializing in religion and ethnicity in China's ethnic Southwest. Currently, Giron is a lecturer in Chinese history and religion and comparative readings of Buddhist, Taoist, and Jewish Hasidic texts at Bar-Alai <coughs> University and Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Since September 2018, he's been working as a researcher for Ariel University, conducting research on Christian Zionist activity in Judea and Samaria. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon. It's really nice to be back here. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. So, okay, yeah, the talk today uh, is going to be about a specific group called Hayovel, Group of Christian Zionism. Zionists active as volunteers in Samaria. I'll tell you a little bit about them, and uh, you know I can't, I can't help uh, the temptation of saying that this is a work in progress, uh, but actually this is also a theology in progress. So in that sense, uh, I, I will try and demonstrate that the, the, 
the theology <coughs> that I will be speaking about uh, of this group uh, is, is being shaped today. So this is based on, on field work uh, conducted in, in, in Samaria uh, this past year uh, uh, in the, with the help of our university and the Ministry of Science. Uh, and I would, my claim is, that I'd like to uh, hypothesize here that the practices of this group, uh, of this group called Hayoven, are a divergence, a certain divergence from evangelical attitudes towards space and sacred space, Protestant evangelical uh, attitudes towards uh, sacred space, uh, which I'll speak about in a little bit in a minute. Uh, although, um, Obviously, uh, the Holy Land is different than all sacred spaces, uh, uh, but I would like to assert that there, there is a certain uh, difference. And I want to speak about Hayofel uh, as a kind of a double critique. Uh, and I'm going to kind of interchange the two. Uh, on the one hand, it's a criticism of uh, global globalism and non-space and the, the moving towards abstractness on the global level, and at the same time, it's a very self-conscious criticism of Protestant abstractness, and that's why I call the, this lecture Back to Earth, uh, and uh, trying to uh, move from abstract faith, which is often <coughs> rightly or wrongly uh, associated with evangelical uh, theology, to a more concrete, a much more concrete experience of faith. Uh, I'll say that, as you, as, as you mentioned, I worked in China with missionaries in China. They were very, very much into a very, very abstract um, uh, form of, of, of Christianity, very, very opposed to the building of churches and to, to any ascribing of, of sacred space. These, these people who I will speak about today uh, are very similar in many ways, uh, but in, on the issue of space, there is a different perspective, and that, that's one. But another point that I'm trying to make is that this kind of turning, turning uh, away from abstractness is a form of return, and it is, is kind of theorized as a, as a multi-layer form of return. It's a return to the Jewish roots of Christianity, very present among this group, as you will see in a minute. It's a return to the land uh, in all kinds of uh, different forms. And at the same time, it's also a, an attempt to live in the, in the Bible, to live in the land, as the, in, to see the Bible as the present. As the present, in other words, to take part in the fulfillment of prophecies. So that is uh, kind of my preface. Uh, so just a few quotations from, that I like uh, about uh, evangelical Christianity and sacred space. From Philip Jenkins uh, a, talks about evangelical Christianity, about as a potent theology for a world of migrants and wanderers, those who define their identity in terms not of roots, but of ropes, roots, roots. Uh, and uh, from Elizabeth McAllister, who did work on evangelical uh, conversion in, in Haiti, very interesting work, I think. Evangelical conversion allows for territorial detachment, loosening of nationalists, and even f familial bonds. And I can bring many, many such quotations. And in fact, often in <coughs> literature of sacred space, Protestantism is uh, kind of not taken very, very seriously. I'd like to, of course, kind of put this, this is, I, that, I don't want to make too much of a case of it. Obviously, as I said, the Holy Land is different, and as many who wrote, and uh, Jackie Feldman has written about this and others, that the Holy Land, there is, there, are, there is a concept of sacred space uh, uh, in Protestantism relating to the Holy Land, uh, and especially open, empty spaces of the Holy Land since the 19th century and, and the whole archaeological endeavor here uh, is a form of, of a relation to sacred space and it's not, and so I don't want to make the case too extreme, uh, but in general I would say with caution that the evangelical attitude towards space or uh, towards sacred space, especially towards buildings like the Holy Sepulchre or something like that is, tends to be rather hostile. Uh, in the sense that um, faith should be based not on, on spatial practices, which is associated with uh, you know, the churches, uh, Catholics and, and Orthodox uh, churches. Um, uh, and as I said, in, in a sense, all of Christian Zionism has moved away from that. Hayovet is, is a more extreme 
extreme form. So just a word about Christian Zionism, kind of a general, um, uh, general, uh, you know, note on Christian Zionism. Just here, the, if, uh, a few organizations that you may have heard of, uh, and a, a definition. Uh, so the Friends of Zion the Museum, which is a fairly recent, uh, it's not an organization, it's a museum, but it's Christian Zionism. Uh, um, uh, it's kind of connected to Pastor Hagee, who some of you have heard about. He was kind of very dominant in the American embassy uh, moving. And there's a, an organization called Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, which kind of uh, is mostly about getting donations from, but also does some tourism. Uh, Christians mostly in Judea and Samaria. I would say only in Judea and Samaria. And heartland, heartland is, is another term for Judea and Samaria. Uh, and Kufi, maybe the most, the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, Christians United for Israel, the biggest organization. But there, there are several organizations, and, and I don't, you know, they, they are, they're quite uh, important in the United States. Many, uh, they are mostly American. Although, as I will show you today, there are many, some of the volunteers are not American, but the base of Christian Zionism is American. Here's a definition by uh, Michael Knight from another organization called Christian Standing with Israel. Christian Zionism is the belief which holds that the land of Israel is sacred ground given by God to a people whom he foreknew, the Jewish people, the apple of his eye. So I brought this quotation because it does stress the idea of the land and not only the people. And of course, you know, uh, there is a political context here, especially if we're talking about Judea and Samaria, and that is definitely in the background uh, and maybe more than in the background. Um, uh, so we can speak about that later. But um, here's from the mission statement of Hayover. Uh, our mission is to take an active role in and educate people about the prophetic restoration of the land of Israel that is happening today. Notice the emphasis. Today, in other words, prophecies are happening today, and therefore we are participating in the Bible today. You know, we are, this, is, this is living the Bible and in really, in a sense, create, re creating it. And the foundation of this idea is really in this wonderful verse, uh, which is uh, in, in English, the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. I don't know if I mentioned, but the Hayover, Hayover, the, what Hayover does is agricultural volunteer work, and it does it mostly in the vineyards, almost exclusively in the vineyards of Samaria, uh, Tulap, Sagot, and Hawaha. I'll say a little more about that later, but that's what they do. They do agricultural work. So this verse is really. Um, I would say kind of the motto of the organization in the sense that this is this is what they are doing. They are the sons of the foreigner coming to be the vine dressers. Uh, you know, so they are fulfilling prophecy just by being here and just picking grapes. That's uh, their words. So, okay, a few words about the uh, history of the organization, how it uh, was founded. Hayovet um, is actually really a family family of. Uh, founded a uh, story. The, the, the person who founded it is a guy by the name of Tommy Waller. Uh, Tommy Waller, uh, the Waller family, uh, originally from Missouri, Tennessee, that area, rural Missouri, uh, Tennessee. And really, the organization started as an American counterculture. And it, kind, of, kind of an American countercultural movement. And that's important because the, 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 the way they tell the story, the way the story was told to me both by Tommy and his, his son, they have 11 children, all active in the, uh, in the organization, was that the organization began with the move to homeschool. The people decided, uh, Waller, uh, Tommy and Sherry Waller decided to move away from the secular American school system in which, like you know, the, the exact question was in which people have replaced man, have replaced God with man, and this kind of feel good uh, education, and they decided to move to homeschooling. And after moving to homeschooling, they decided to actually found their own church. They said, if, if we're already homeschooling, then we will provide religious education as well. We're not going to be dependent on any church. And as they started moving down that path, they started moving more and more towards the Hebraic roots of, of, of Judaism. Again, not uncommon in Christian Zionist uh, uh, but the has taken it so slowly, the observance of Shabbat, no more Sunday, Shabbat, slowly the adoption of some form of, of kashrut laws. They don't eat, most of them at least don't eat pork anymore, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Many, many such things moving. Uh, and there, at this point, Tommy Waller also started to develop kind of an anti-technological 
mm. narrative moved into a Mennonite community for six years. And this, mm. this quotation, I think, is important. This is from the site, from Hayovel's site, in which he describes himself. That living off the grid for six years, stripped away, is my, <coughs> my, uh, my uh, emphasis, uh, all, all the distraction of the modern American lifestyle while developing strong family ties and work ethics. So I think this idea of being stripped away, being taken, being kind of peeling away the veneer or the you know of American uh, culture, moving kind of towards this oppositional uh, position, is very essential to the, the the movements. I should say did not retain that anti-technological aspect. They use technology. I mean, they're not they're not Mennonites and they're not Amish, but they have there's definitely that kind of narrative there as uh, it's definitely present, and they all homeschool. Uh, eventually, as their path continued, they noticed uh, something about the Bible that it mentions Israel a lot. And that was, you know, really kind of, you know, Israel kept coming up all the time. And they decided that a visit to Israel is, is necessary. And to visit Israel, and Tommy Waller, in fact, did come to Israel, I think in 2003 or four. I'm not sure. And he uh, was offered to meet a Israeli farmer. Uh, they took him to Samaria. He met uh, Neil Levy. Who is uh, the um, who runs the winery at Halbacha? And Navi took him out to the fields and read those verses from Isaiah and also some verses from Jeremiah, in which he describes the you know the, there will be there will again I should have brought it there will again be fields being planted in the land in Samaria. And for Waller that was the revelation. That's he decided that that's what he wanted to do, and indeed he went back home and founded the organization Hayove, which brings volunteers. Uh, they've probably brought over probably 2,000 volunteers at this point uh, over a period of about 15 years uh, to do the work of, uh, of the, the, the vineyards. In other words, to pick to pick grapes uh, in uh, the vineyards. Um, in the vineyards of Samaria and, 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 uh, and Benjamin. Uh, here is the, uh, just uh, if you want to see the Waller family. Um, there's a lot of them. What are we here for, Geula? <laughs> this is just, the title is just what I heard from, that's kind of the, the motto that they were using on the field. I was, went out to pick grapes with them. So this is kind of a, a slogan that they, if, if you will, that they used while picking game, grapes, you know, kind of like a youth movement. What are you here for? Uh, somebody asks and everybody answers Geula, you know, the Hebrew word for salvation. Uh, and you may notice that they're dressed very similar to settlers. Mm -hmm. and, and this is modesty. Uh, the idea of modesty has become part of their. Um, so they all, they all, the women all cover their hair and hair and so on. They kind of moved into that uh, kind of Jewish uh, mode. I should say that you know the, the the idea of working the land and recreating the land also takes takes on a physical aspect, and one of the number of them has, has mentioned the fact that by actually, first of all, by planting the vineyards, they are changing the landscape. They're changing the landscape in an actual way, but they're also creating earth in a very tangible way. In other words, right, the, comp the composting um, uh, vi uh, leaves and grapes actually become, become the earth, so they, you know, they're very uh, much uh, aware of that kind of uh, that position of recreating, uh, recreating uh, the land as a sacred, as a sacred site. So here are just a few two quotations I, I want to read about that to, to kind of demonstrate the, the special uh, connection of the land. The land really as a not just as a place, and unlike I ventured to, this may be too early to say this, but I, I, many of the I've done some work now with uh, some other Christian groups and and. and while for some Christian groups the, the idea of being in the land is more a matter of experience, here really the, the, um, the emphasis is on uh, the holiness of the land itself. Uh, maybe we can talk, speak more about that later. With uh, so here's from one uh, Swedish volunteer. This is actually on the site, um, on the Hayovel site. I, uh, so the first time I came, I was here for 12 weeks. Many of them, by the way, have return, returned for many, many trips. In other words, they volunteer, they go back, and they volunteer over and over again. I forgot to mention that they, uh, where, they're, where they're stationed, they're based in Halbacha, which is right over the city of Shechem. Uh, and maybe we can go back here, actually. This is Tommy Waller with Rav Eliezer Menamed, who is their patron, basically. Uh, and he's the rabbi of Halbacha. 
uh, and very interesting relationship has been created there. I won't have time to speak about it so much, but uh, between of uh, Menamed uh, and uh, the and uh, the Wallers, they have their own hill, basically right adjacent into the uh, to the settlement. Not not really in the settlement, but it's kind of a little, little down the road, uh, where they have a base, and they're there maybe about the staff is there. About, I would say about six to eight months of the year. The groups themselves only come in the summertime, and then there's a winter group. Uh, for the pruning of the grapes. So actually, the, the most of the time it's, it's empty, but the staff is is uh, is, um, is has basically almost I would say half relocated here, which is interesting in itself. So uh, I'll just read this quickly because I see I'm running out of time. Five minutes? Is that it? Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll just read the, the kind of quickly. The first time I came here, I was here for 12 weeks. During that time, I was able to connect to the land, and every time I come back, I get more rooted in the land. And, I guess, and I feel more and more connected to both the people, to everything, to God, to the scriptures, and like there's no other place where I'd rather be. So on the one hand, there is, and you can read Zach Waller's quotation um, by yourself, but on the one hand, there is that element of it, you know, really, really feeling that, and I've heard from several of them that they would like to be in the land permanently. On the other hand, here's a quotation from, uh, from Nate Waller, one of the kids, you know, uh, uh, he said, if Messiah has a place for me in Tennessee, that's good enough for me. In other words, they do not feel that they have to actually relocate, which is interesting to me. They're, as a position to be in, as a theological position, they are content with being in the position of the nations, in that peripheral <coughs> sense. They are here to help. They don't actually have to live here uh, to, 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 to fulfill, but they would like to have this connection uh, with the land, this continuous connection. Uh, with the land and the messianic era, uh, some of them have voiced the feeling that they would like to have a refuge here, but again, not necessarily uh, living here in, in practicality. So, okay, here's uh, more to the, to the point I was starting with, this idea of, you know, what we call doing and not being. So here's just a quotation of one of the guys, you know, I'm not interested in being a tourist, I want to do something. I'm not going to show you the video because we don't have time, but, but this is very much uh, the feeling of what you hear from many of the children in, from the Waller family is that Christians are sick of this kind of abstract Christianity. They're tired of it. They want something concrete and tangible, and concrete and tangible is here. Here in Israel, we can actually connect and, and touch the land itself, and as I said, that's done through the agricultural work. That's a very central element of, of, uh, of what's done. They do... Uh, 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 the vines, and I already spoke about that. Another way that it's done is through touring of certain holy sites. Uh, one of them is Shiloh, for example. Uh, before coming to Oxford, she uh, gained her MA from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Um, focusing on early German cultural Zionism and gender, her doctoral thesis aims to reassess cultural Zionism by considering women's experiences and the function of the private sphere. and has 
some prominent members who went on to be active in other types of Zionism or other fields. Uh, some members include Martin Greenberg, who was one of the most um, famous spokespeople for the movement, and the artist Ian William, who went on to produce um, some famous artworks, such as this one here, as well as artworks that went on to become kind of um, iconic in political Zionism as well. So here, for instance, we have um, a souvenir card that he made for, uh, for the Fifth Zionist Congress. Um, as well as producing artworks, um, the movement mobilised uh, to produce um, a publishing house which put out volumes such as the one on the left, uh, which was a collection of different um, artworks, um, uh, poems and literature that was really meant to represent the kind of the blossoming of Jewish culture. And then on the right hand side we have um, uh, one of the newspapers that they also circulated. So as cultural Zionists rather than political Zionists, they were suggesting that a rejuvenation of Jewish culture would be what would provide a point of uh, coherence and unity for Jews rather than an immediate uh, priority of the Jewish state. So they did support the, um, the idea of a Jewish state happening in the future, but unlike the political Zionists um, who were active at the same time, they weren't working towards this as a priority. What was the priority for them was to form this, uh, this robust Jewish culture, which could then go on to feed Jewish life, whether in exile or in an imagined future homeland. Um, so when scholars discuss this movement, um, they generally focus on its intellectual side and deem it to be secular. Um, for me, this is problematic in a, a couple of ways. Primarily in the fact that it's derived almost exclusively from considerations of the public sphere and mostly of the noisy men within it. Um, so, uh, in this presentation, I'm hoping to challenge this idea of it as secular or at least muddy it uh, by considering the function um, and the experiences that could be attainable within the private sphere and especially by uh, the women within it. Um, and so I hope to ultimately consider what is obscured in the movement when we call it secular. Um, so to the second part of my presentation, uh, which I'll begin by uh, discussing some of the, ro the roles that uh, writers imagined for women within the movement. Um, so the first of these is Bertolt Freibel, who was a um, prominent writer um, and editor and was one of the, um, uh, the main figures in the publishing house. Um, he, uh, when he wrote about Jewish women, suggested that their relationship to Judaism was one that was primarily emotional, and that the greatest gift they could give their children and the movement as a whole was to pass on the emotional bond between a Jew and Judaism to their children. Um, so he wrote, um, those young children to whom the mother has given something of the Jewish spirit will never forget their Judaism. By contrast, the children who didn't receive this from their mother uh, would be unable to gain this, uh, this significant relationship in the future, would possibly go on to assimilate, and would also really not have a share in the Zionist future. Um, this assessment of women's uh, roles as primarily as domestic educators um, is something that was common to kind of Central European bourgeois attitudes to women in general and wasn't uh, unique to the Zionist movement. Um, and it is a, an opinion that's seen um, in other writers. Uh, such as Martin Buber, who also uh, suggested that uh, women should, should work in this domestic way as educators. Um, so he turned to historic paradigms to demonstrate the importance of this role, writing, uh, women reached their greatest importance in the ghetto period. The free life of the state was replaced by the more narrow but joyous life of the family. She brought a wonderful natural freshness to the home, which replaced the lost young grain of the homeland. Um, so in this clear, politically <coughs> inspired account of the homeland, we start to see um, evidence of um, the homeland is not necessarily a place, but experience, and an experience that could be created uh, from within exile and from within the home. So despite the um, lofty uh, idea of praising this and the importance that Buber gives to women, it must be noted that he did not give them um, intellectual autonomy or any independence in doing this, but rather saw their work in doing this as merely applying the ideas developed by men in the public sphere within the private sphere. So he says, it is the man who will find and theoretically develop
lot of cultural ideas, but they need long to realise them. So it's that uh, as important as the private sphere was, it was ultimately a second uh, logical order to the public sphere. In uh, contemporary writings by Paul Winkler, also from 1901, um, we have an account of the home uh, similarly functioning as a homeland experience created by Jewish women. Uh, but this account does give Jewish women uh, creativity, um, intellectual autonomy, and independence. Um, in fact, in uh, two more significant uh, essays on Jewish women, she doesn't mention them once. Um, so she writes, uh, It is up to the women to find out, with fine and sure feeling, what promises future infertility and to prepare a place for it in her home. So we have here a kind of inversion of Hoover's. Um, remarks it is a Jewish woman who can use their own judgment to decide what would be a benefit to the Zionist movement and to create it themselves. Um, so we have uh, similar comments from Winkler echoing some of Buber's remarks about the home functioning as homeland um, and also reflecting the kind of cultural Zionist aspiration towards a future that Zionist state but one that was still really imaginative and not um, a kind of permanent reality. Today and until the achievement of the Zionist goal, until the recovery of the old ancient soil, must the Jewish house and the Jewish house alone form the homeland of the Jewish people. So I think uh, this quote is quite helpful in um, pointing to the past, present and future as all kind of um, incarnations of this homeland as experience um, notion. Um, so uh, Finkler fleshes out the way that the, um, the home would function as a homeland in uh, multiple different ways. Like Fievel and Buber, she talks about it being um, a place where Jewish children could be educated by their parents. But significantly, she also talks about it as a centre for um, Zionist uh, intellectual and um, artistic life. Uh, she looks back to the example of the German romantic salons where Jewish women had um, hosted uh, intellectuals and artists and made their homes the environments where that um, culture and intellectual life had developed and suggests that Jewish women could do the same in their homes for Zionist uh, culture, um, making their home the kind of the site of its development. So this is really quite a clear departure from, um, from figures like Buber and the um, editors of these uh, publications and newspapers who really promoted this public sphere activity as kind of the basic part of Zionist intellectual life. Um, other features of the Jewish home for Winkler um, included Jewish art on the walls um, and significantly um, a sphere in which to develop new Jewish customs and rituals. She doesn't specify what these would be but really notes that the existing Jewish customs don't fit the time. Uh, that new customs need to be developed and really once again leaves it up to the Jewish woman in her private space to start to develop these new forms of, um, of Jewish Zionist practice. And I think this is particularly important because it draws attention to that space as being an embodied place where actions happened. Mm -hmm. It was not a, a detached and um, purely intellectual movement. Um, so for Winkler, ultimately, um, stimulation, excitement, movement and security would fall out of the Jewish house and something totally wonderful, a presentiment of the homeland. And I think the, the picture that really evolves here is um, not merely a presentiment of the homeland, but a kind of a transplantation of the homeland as experience into exile. In what I think is actually kind of a radical um, disruption of the binaries of homeland and exile, both spatially and temporally. Um, and I think in uh, this uh, presentation, uh, we saw a really clear example of a strictly linear progression from one to the other. Uh, it, I think, uh, starts to disrupt that, although it uh, should uh, be, I think it's important to remain mindful that this was uh, not in opposition to a, a, a particular Jewish state or political world. Um, so um, on to the third part of my presentation, where I'd like to start moving towards analysing the function of this private homeland experience as a sacred space. Um, and I'll be doing so with reference to um, Sia Eliade's book, The Sacred and the Profane. Um, in this book, Eliade has uh, The Sacred and the Profane has two radically different spheres. Uh, the profane is the, the realm of everyday life, the, the world around, and of temporal time that he suggests for religious communities doesn't hold any intrinsic value or 
is of ultimate value to religious communities is the sacred, um, totally different sphere that gives uh, meaning, orientation, religious power, and ultimate reality. Um, so the way that he suggests that religious communities can access um, the sacred is through hierophanies, which are uh, the manifestation of something of a wholly different order, a reality that does not belong to our world, and objects that are an integral part of our natural, profane world. Um, so fairly ideal objects like a tree or a stone um, could become sites of hierophanies, manifesting this sacred realm um, in this kind of eruption of the sacred within the profane. And he does acknowledge the kind of the contradictory aspect of an object like a stone existing in these two spheres, writing, by manifesting the sacred, any object becomes something else, yet it continues to remain itself, it continues to participate in its surrounding cosmic milieu. And this is really, I think, the first point of significant structural similarity to the idea of the cultural Zionist homeland in the home. Because at the same time that the Jewish house remains a physical building in Central Europe at, in 1901, it also becomes the homeland, uh, as we've seen, is something that is uh, from a past paradigm and an anticipated future hope. Um, so Eliade fleshes out the notion of the sacred um, in too many ways, uh, with reference to sacred space and sacred time. So uh, sacred space, as I suggested, um, uh, is something that establishes order within the profane world, giving a point of orientation around which religious communities can organise their lives um, and their, their kind of understanding of meaning. Um, and sacred time, uh, for an early, is it in contrast to profane time? So a profane time is historical in nature. Uh, sacred time um, is, as he writes, uh, always recoverable and repeatable. So in a um, in an event like a uh, celebration of the creation of the world, for instance, uh, a religious community can actually become contemporary with the gods in the world of creation. They don't just recall it, but they enter that sacred time and join the gods. And that uh, provides them with a sense of renewal and recreation um, that is of immense significance to their lives and the world that they inhabit. Um, so I would just like to draw a couple of parallels between these two structures with elements from uh, Pink Flame Brew that I've uh, covered. Um, firstly, with sacred space, um, as I mentioned, one of the things Winkler suggested the mother would do would be to educate her children. Um, and so she writes of um, the child's growing understanding of what it means to be Jewish uh, within Germany. Um, the mother must bring the child to early awareness of the contrast in which they stand to their surroundings, a great happy home which she thereby bestowed to her homeless children. So for the Jewish child who suddenly understands what it means to be Jewish by virtue of this domestic education, they can suddenly place themselves into relation to the communities around them, the nations around them, and have this sight of orientation um, that helps them understand the world and map it. Um, and as for sacred time, uh, we've already heard this quote from Winkler, until the recovery of the old ancient soil, must the Jewish house and the Jewish house alone form the homeland of the Jewish people. And um, as I mentioned, uh, this is kind of past, present, and future all rolled up into one repeatable experience, which I do think mapped onto Eliade's notion of um, sacred time as uh, recoverable and repeatable. And secondly, a remark from Google that I think illustrates the sense in which this uh, renews the world. The Jewish woman will once more turn the home into what it once was, a centre of life, a place of recovery, a source of ever new strength. So I think across these two axes um, of sacred space and sacred time, uh, the homeland and the home functions um, in a similar way, uh, providing a kind of trans-temporal and trans-spatial encounter with this, um, with this homeland and that kind of penetrates the expansive exile or profane um, uh, with this meaning. Um, so I suppose, uh, by way of this comparison, I don't mean to suggest that the cultural Zionist home was something that Eliade himself might have recognised as substantially sacred, or that he would have necessarily raised these communities as religious. Um, the purpose of this comparison has really been more to draw the kind of structural similarities to demonstrate the beginnings of an approach of assessing um, this phenomenon as um, approaching sacred space with the ultimate order of just beginning to disrupt the the blanket uh, description of um, cultural Zionism as secular, because I believe that by doing that, a lot of the, um, the nuance of these domestic 
effective ritual embodied activities are really lost. Um, and that by starting to kind of investigate them from these different <coughs> angles, um, analysis of um, time, space, and place in this way, we can start to kind of appreciate some of the, um, some of the, I think, the most interesting and le less explored parts of cultural Zionism. Um, so yeah, I think as I move on with this project, I'll, I'll continue um, making this comparison with different accounts of sacred space. Um, scholarship has come on since Eliade, but I, I think Hopefully I've demonstrated that he still has something to offer in terms of uh, this paradigm. So yeah, I'm very open to any questions or comments on the speaker. Thank you. interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm at first amused, but also interested by this, uh, if we are bringing of Eliade to, to uh, you know, to this um, uh, uh, domestic and, and, and um, you know, and, uh, and feminine sphere. Um, uh, you know what, let me pass. I don't have my, I don't have my thoughts. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you. And again, following on Jackie, it's interesting to, to kind of <coughs> juxtapose Eliade into this. Um, again, because he's, he's very much, um, you know, um, not a, a, a thinker of the home. Um, uh, he's, and and you're, you're bringing him in, and it's, and it, it, it's, it's stimulating. Uh, what I was interested in are two things. First of all, if you can say something a bit about Paula Winkler. Uh, her background, because Boober, you know, Boober's Boober. We know all about him. I mean, people who grew up in this country uh, know who Boober is, and, and, and he brings in a lot of home-oriented traditions. Um, he comes from a Hasidic slash scholarly background. He comes from the more eastern parts of, uh, of the German-speaking lands. He's, he was born in, in Vienna in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so he's making this move from the periphery of Germany into the Heimat, into the homeland of Germany. So that, we, that I can wrap my head around, but um, who is she? Where is she coming from? Uh, that, that, that to me is a question. And the other thing that I think is, is important here has to do with who are these people competing with? And I think that a lot of uh, what they are putting on the table seems to me um, and, and this is a hypothesis, and you can I either reject it or, 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 or take it in, is the, one of the notions that's very big in the late 19th century, especially within German Jewish um, <coughs> experience, is the issue of being part and parcel with the bourgeois. Uh, and a lot of uh, the language that is going on is pro-bourgeois and also anti-socialist, anti the alienation of socialism. Socialism speaks very strongly about alienation and how um, the modern society alienates people from one another. So here comes this kind of theology theory of the Jewish home, which is a distorted mirror image of what the socialists are trying to pitch. Uh, and to me, this is very interesting. Um, so this may be kind of a backdrop against which to read these sources. And you can either affirm that or say that I'm speaking absolute nonsense. Well, I'll answer your first question first. And I'm delighted that you asked me to talk about Carla Winkler, one of my favorite things to do. Okay. Um, she, um, I did mention, because I don't like reading her through the shadow of her husband, but she was married to Martin Winkler. <coughs> um, and she, um, she wasn't Jewish. She um, she converted to Judaism in 1906, but these articles were written in 1901. So she was an active um, contributor to cultural Zionism, but at that stage uh, not um, converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, she was a, a, extremely um, adventurous and intellectually agile person. Um, she was one of uh, the first women students at the University of Zurich. Um, mm -hmm. She resided in a mystical artist's colony um, in 1899 um, and really had a very, um, I think, a very experimental and rich um, intellectual background. And I, I think that background is, in fact, the source of a lot of 
Ruben's early rich work, for which he's given no credit. So, for instance, his work on the Hasidic tales, mm -hmm. a lot of that was Finkler's work, so mm -hmm. he wasn't, he didn't credit her for. And in fact, makes quite explicit claims that he inhabited the spirit of Hasidim, mm -hmm. and he did it all on his own. But actually, there's plenty of evidence that she did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So she was a very, um, <clears throat> I think, a, a very a very creative thinker, but one that she wasn't awarded very much credit for it. Um, she, after she got married to Weber, um, <coughs> reading uh, accounts from her family members suggested that she didn't really want to be uh, known in relation to him, so she moved after her marriage to only writing under a pseudonym, and also moved into writing fiction. So mm -hmm. her Zionist writings were from a relatively contained period, but I do think represent quite significant intervention in some of the mm. existing dialogues. Um, I'll stop there, but I'll be happy to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of who they're competing with, I think the relationship with cultural Zionism to border ideas is really interesting, especially around the idea of gender, because while some of the, the famous images by Lillian of these um, very Art Nouveau inspired uh, women look extremely liberated, the ideas for women, well, the iconography of women who are young, able-bodied, heterosexual, and, you know, um, representing this kind of ideal future of the Jewish youth is uh, drastically different from the ideas of the married mothers <coughs> and what they actually wanted them to do in Europe at the time. So I think that in terms of the kind of the social organisation that the movement wanted was very, very close to what <coughs> Mm -hmm. ideas about gender, mm -hmm. I mean, especially with the domestic education, as I mentioned. Um, but I suppose the other thing to mention is that this wasn't, at least this kind of this young Jewish German movement, it wasn't particularly coherent or consistent. And even the ideas that I mentioned aren't representative of every member. Um, there wasn't really enough writing on women to, to say mm -hmm. that there was a consistent position across the years. Um, so I think who they're competing is kind of in a given moment depends on who's writing and what months they're writing. So I, I think um, that's a, a complicated question that has to really be traced issue by issue and can't be answered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. analysis also of what a home looked like and, and what kinds of uh, other you know, cosmological meanings might be entailed by the way you know, homes are constructed. I'm thinking of Bachelau for a minute, right? the idea of, a, of the poetry of space and the idea of home as something that encloses as home as, as kind of a, uh, um, a, a kind of a nurturing shell at which one make you know finds one's place in the world and then the feminist critique of Bachelau that you know that it assumes that he goes back and sits home comfortably in his armchair and there's someone else who's prepared someone else namely the woman who has prepared you know the drink the armchair the, the fire you know going in the fireplace and that it's a very this is a very you know masculine kind of imagination around the home I don't know to what extent that interplays when you begin to analyze, if you begin to analyze the <coughs> artifacts and the way these homes look and what kinds of meanings they have. Another question that's related is that, you know, we have this, on, on the one hand, the kind of imagination of the homeland being through the home. I thought, thought the homeless children is really quite poignant, you know, the idea that, that you know, all you have is the home outside here is, is the, the Eliadis terms, you know, the Zenos, the wilderness, the chaos, the, minute you leave the, the threshold of your home. Um, but at the same time, we have certainly within German, German Jewry at the time, um, the roots of the Israeli youth movements, the idea of the Wanderfug, mm -hmm. right, the free birds, which is sort of, at least in its image, an antithesis to the home. Even with, now I'm not drawing on Germany, but say in the, in the 30s, you have Mordechai and Ilevich going and doing these exercises where they go up to the top of the Tatra and imagine they're looking over the Galilee, this, this kind of, you know, nature imagination of being, you know, uprooted in order to be rooted, to get out of the home, to get back to nature, and nature being as opposed to some kind of enclosed space, perhaps of 
of the home in the synagogue. Uh, mm -hmm. Inflating probably too much, but it's not a question, but I see it. So regarding your comment on analyzing the structure of homes and then reflecting the cosmos, I don't actually think that is quite Eliard again, because he does talk about the kind of parallel structures between, you know, the body, the home, the cosmos, rather well, than churches or other religious buildings, cities, and then the cosmos. Um, so I suppose in that respect, even if doing it um, with attention to women isn't any idea in the assessment of the structure of the home would be. But I think ultimately that's probably not the exact direction I'll be taking, um, and rather in reference to your second point about the context. Uh, absolutely, the, around the time, the kind of the focus on nature, which I think you see creeping into the Bible with his mention of the lobster and green and this kind of idealization of nature. But I suppose my real point is that, um, <coughs> even as that is brought into cultural Zionism, um, with all of the illustrations of, of this <coughs> wonderful fertile nature imagery, um, that is exclusionary of women and the women that were bearing these children and educating them. So I think there's a real split consciousness in cultural Zionism that on the one hand is very expansive and <coughs> explorative um, and allows the kind of the imagination of um, you know uh, <coughs> the new communities going out into nature and to the world. Um, and, but it kind of to consider that without the, the women who are, you know, as you say, trapped trapped behind um, making it happen is I think kind of just perpetuating the, the focus on the, the, the male intellectual sphere and how I imagine that life would be in, in nature. So I think what I really want to do <coughs> is just to find different lenses to analyse what was happening in, in the background and in the private space. Okay, thank you, Rosie. Thank interactions between the two so you might be talking about like evangelical tradition this and this but there's not a tradition also in place yeah so uh, what are the influences over there that's one thing uh, the second point I wanted to make and kind of fits in what, what Stephen was saying earlier is and this is kind of a psychological proposal and, and I just learned that I've been using the word creation it's pejorative so so maybe I'm not qualified uh, to do so, but to 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 frame uh, the Hayabal movement as as a departure from from classical evangelical, <coughs> in a sense, also I felt like Protestant notions uh, towards space. Um, you might want to rephrase it into uh, representing one part of an one side of a profoundly ambivalent tra Protestant tradition towards space, which always is switching in different ways. Mm -hmm. But you already gave some examples from, from the United States. You can add a, a number of other, like for instance, the Mormons, yeah, who turn America into some kind of sacred space. Uh, the relationship between uh, nationalism and, and Protestantism, which has been really strong in the early modern period. So you can make many connections there um, so, so I, I would, I, I would, I know it's not uh, natural for anthropologists, but like go back in time and, and explore a little bit the, the relationship between Protestantism and space as something ambivalent rather than something negative. Um, okay, amen for you. 
Um, Rose and Davidi, um, two small specific points. Uh, Davidi, I read the word like linear notion of time. He always always goes wrong when you start talking about that. Like people have been talking about the, the circular time of the ancients versus the linear time of the Judeo Christian traditions, then the circular time of the Jews versus uh, the linear time of Christians. Now, uh, rich as an ideology with linear time versus, I guess, religion as religion, etc., you always end up in trouble because these, these are usually uh, messy things. Um, another a uh, small point for, for, for Rose is this notion as, as, as the family, the home, as, as, as sacred space, uh, as, as identified with, with, uh, with Zionism, this is actually really old. Yeah? Well, let's say temple was destroyed, we can, we can retrace, even, maybe even before. So in Judaism we already have a really old tradition as the home, as, as, as Either, maybe not the sacred space, space, but like a place where you have very central uh, Jewish rituals. But those, those are like small remarks. Um, and then in, in, in both of your presentations, I felt that you, there were a few remarks that, that I felt that the, the assumption was that, that Zionism is a secular ideology which is different from a, a religious ideology and, and both your examples kind of served and, and you can tell me afterwards if they allow you because they want to eat uh, if I'm wrong um, both examples served in a way to, to uproot this notion that secular Zionism is truly really secular that the either religious substrata in, 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 in Secular Zionism, which basically is not secular Zionism, mm -hmm. or that secular Zionism can, can kind of fail and fall back into religious Zionism. Mm -hmm. And, and um, <coughs> for instance, also like with, with the example of Mecha Eliade, Mecha Eliade is to three people in this room the intellectual grandfather because we all were at the University of Chicago Divinity School and we were the students of the students. Um, and, and, and that brings me to the notion of. of I think you have to be really careful in talking about religious and not religious because some some definitions have been brought up, and and you, you might kind of end up just losing your way in in saying oh this is a religious approach and this is not a religious approach and and I would suggest do more um, first of all calm down a little bit with the distinction religious and not religious. And, and then start an ethic. And so the, in, in Rose's uh, lectures, you use the term uh, using religious structures. I think you use the word structure. You can also use morphology from, from religious traditions for what are not inherently religious projects, such as creating a secular state. Um, and this is, these are developments which have been. Um, uh, part and parcel of the Western religious tradition, for instance, this whole notion of the transcendental, which used to be the superhuman realm, mm -hmm. and then naughty philosophers like Descartes, Kant, Hegel came and they created a new kind of transcendental, whether it's like the self, the mind, history, and then Marx comes along with also more history. Yeah, so, 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 this would lead you not to argue, well, actually, like we can expose Marx as a religious thinker because he's using uh, ways of thinking that are very similar to religious, but more like how are traditional religious structures being used in a non-religious uh, 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 environment, rather than saying, well, actually, they're really religious, even though they don't seem to be. Because I think that's kind of a, a dead-end argument to, to, to start to think in those terms. Yeah? I will not keep you further. I think maybe if you have to respond to this, like you, you can keep that further. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> would, any, would any of you like to? Uh, I can respond. Yeah. Uh, can I sit? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, religion, I think Anna talked about this this morning that religion is. You can't say religion. Because religion, if we know, all know this uh, here, to try to define religion. Uh, but, uh, you can't avoid using religion and secular in, in 
social, social, sociological uh, terms. There's, there's a group of people, there's a sector who are defining themselves as religious. And there are a group of people who define themselves, themselves as secular. Now, and in Israeli society, there's a really big uh, um, amount, amount of people that uh, define themselves as traditional, but this is a, a case for another talk. Um, even though these definitions are not empirically and theologically and whatever, they're not true. People you can make them. You can yeah, them. No, no, they're I'm not, not being a postmodernist. No, no, I think they're 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 not. You, you can't you can't point your finger and say, okay, he's one, two, three, four, five. He's religious. He's one, two, three. He's he's secular. And especially in Judaism and Israelism. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we were talking about uh, Martin Bobel, so one of his friends, enemies, I don't know, Gershom Scholem, mm -hmm. who talked about the Hebrew, that you can't be secular when you talk Hebrew, because the Mashiach is coming from, uh, you know, I can't quote and I can't translate in, in <coughs> at the same time. But he talks about you can't be secular Jew and talk Hebrew. So Zionism is, and I tried to say, Zionism is not. A, a, a secular ideology. It's an ideology that try, it's, a, it's not a pure secular ideology. It's an ideology that tries to take the Jewish uh, and theological and traditional um, terms and to secularize them, to nationalize them. Um, I wrote it myself the last. I don't remember why, but it will come back. <laughs> Yeah. It will come. It will come to me uh, over over some yeah. serious food. Yeah. But this is this is what I want to say. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Thank you, Alex, for those two very I think important points. I, I want to say first with the, about the second point that you made. I agree. I think that that's correct. That it would be more accurate, and maybe I should even you know, get rid of the word break with, you know, that it would be more accurate. There is an ambivalence, a deep ambivalence, it's not new. And I tried to, you know, to demonstrate. And I think, you know, kind of the trap of anthropologists is that they, they, uh, well, at least for me, I don't want to speak for all anthropologists, is to fall into the perspective of those you interview. And what I was trying to, I don't know if I convey this, is to try to convey is that, the, is that they very much are in this kind of consciousness that they've broken with a certain past. Which is a nice Protestant tradition. Yeah, which is a nice Protestant tradition. That I, but I, it, 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 I mean, Tommy Waller himself kind of, you know, broke with his, with his Baptist father. And it, yeah. it was a, kind of a dramatic thing for them. So for them, they're very much in this ethos. Does that mean that they're not really following patterns that already existed? Probably not. So I, I agree that that should be, you know, that should be uh, refined. That was just kind of bringing their, their voice maybe too forcefully. The issue of the the uh, you know the kind of the settler ideology, I th that I really kind of struggle with where to put that in. I think that that definitely I mean that really demands a lot of attention. Uh, I, but I think it is kind of the second floor above, if I can use that term, above because these are people who hadn't even met a living Jew 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean it's the, the whole this is very new to them. But, it, and I agree, the influence has been, you know, it is very large, but still, I think that the... But there's there's some memory going on. No, what? so like this is intense interaction. <clears throat> At the same time, this is also this notion of difference, like we're right. not converting. So there's this, this, this give yeah. and take and, and mirroring, which is interesting. I think it work. demands, I mean, a, a, a totally, you know, a, a, you know, no, no, the whole issue of borders, and, and, and I didn't even say anything about the fact that within the settler movement there are voices for and very much against. There are those who want no contact with them and are very hostile. So there, there's that too. Thanks. Um, thank you for your comments. It's always good to have a reminder, uh, an amount of caution when using the terms religious and secular. But I suppose the main point of my presentation was not to argue that cultural Zionism was religious, 
so much as to say, what do we obscure by calling it secular? And I think what really falls um, and becomes obscured by that is women's experiences in the private sphere, because this, this definition of secular is almost universally derived from, from the public sphere of writings. Um, and to your other point about the, um, the idea of the Jewish home being sacred as an ancient one, that's absolutely the case. But I, I don't think it's the case when it comes to, to Zionism or cultural Zionism in particular. Um, and so I suppose maybe it would be productive for me to think about starting to build some points of comparison, especially to go further into this transformation of, of custom and to build uh, bridges between the past and the future and the, um, the present would that. Um, uh, but um, yeah, no, I think I think that's everything I have written down. Yeah, just trying to see what's new and calling the cultural Zionist home as a, as a sacred space as well as what's old with it. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you once again to all our panelists and to Alex, and it just remains to give a big round of applause. Yeah.